Hello, and welcome to Asia in Depth. I'm Michelle Flor Cruz. When Americans went to the polls last week, for all the uncertainty, one thing was clear the election was attracting unprecedented interest from across the globe. Certainly, that was true in Asia, where the results would impact everything from Iran to North Korea, trade policy to China policy, and much more. Now, with President-elect Joe Biden having been declared the winner and President Trump refusing to accept the results, the interest continues. In this episode of Asia In-Depth, three experts reflect on the election and what the next four years may portend for the U.S., Asia, and the rest of the world. Participants include Asia Society co-chair and Singapore ambassador-at-large Chan Heng Chi, Asia Society Policy Institute Vice President Wendy Cutler, and Johns Hopkins University professor and former dean of its School of Advanced International Studies, Vali Nasser. The conversation is moderated by Asia Society's Executive Vice President, Tom Nagorski. Ambassador Chan begins the conversation. Let me begin with some hard data. You know, I like hard data. I'm a political scientist. Uh, I came across two polls, one conducted by the British YouGov poll of eight places in the Asia Pacific. I say eight places because it's Taiwan, Hong Kong, Philippines, Thailand, Australia, Malaysia, Indonesia, and Singapore. And there was an Ipsos French market you know, sort of poll. And uh, they asked the same question. Who would you like to win the elections and who do you see winning the elections? The YouGov poll of these eight places I mentioned who are all probably watching you know, this program, Hong Kong, Taiwan, etc., uh, found that overwhelmingly, except for Taiwan, every country chose Biden. They said they wanted Biden to win. Only in Taiwan did uh, the 42% choose um, uh, Mr. Trump and 30% Biden. Singapore was the place where Mr. Biden scored the highest, where most people wanted him, 66% to 12% voting for Trump or wanting Trump. Uh, Indonesia, 63% to 12. Uh, Malaysia, 62 to 9. Australia, 60 to 21. A big group wanted Trump there. Philippines, 59 to 14. Uh, sorry, 47 to 24. And Thailand, 59 to 14. Hong Kong, because you have Hong Kong viewers, 42% rooted for Biden and 36% rooted for Trump. And the Ipsos polls reflected the same. They either wanted Trump to win or thought, sorry, wanted Biden to win or thought Biden would win. Now, I'd be speaking you know, today to someone from Indonesia, one of the leading strategic thinkers, Dino Jalal, and he said, for Muslim countries, there's no doubt that they wanted Biden to win because you know, of the uh, Trump policy on Muslims and they wanted more visas and so on. Overall, I would say, and I've heard these comments just in, not, in, not just in Singapore, but elsewhere, people use the word spectacle, you know, gosh, what a spectacle. And can you imagine this is a US, United American political process. They were in wonderment, you know, and, uh, but that was a great sense of relief that there was a result, there was some clarity, even though they know that could be some challenges, but hoping, you know, this will maintain. I think I'll stop there. Well, I, yeah, you can stop there, but I think I have to follow with just a couple of things, Hengchi. First of all, thank you. It's, I think only at the Asia Society do we get something that I can, I'm pretty sure has not been on any of the cable networks here for the 24 seven coverage we've been getting, which is a kind of exit polling from across Asia. So thank you for that. Um, just a, I, I, my, of course, my mind does go, uh, and I think I know the answer, but uh, let me ask anyway to the question about Taiwan, which if I understand you correctly, would then be the one country that, uh, uh, or, or one part of the world in the region that was different uh, from the rest. And I, does that go basically because uh, the Trump administration has, has stood up for them, you might say, right? I mean, I think that has to do with it a great deal, you know. I think uh, President Trump and his administration has helped to advance Taiwan's position diplomatically and even, you know, in terms of its uh, 
security position and, you know, adding visits, official visits and so on. Something Taiwan never had before from America. You know, it's up to a point and there was a, a limit. But I think the Trump administration extended those boundaries. Yeah. So, Vali Nasser, maybe we, if we can come to you then for... Uh... Uh, kind of the same question, but uh, I'm struck Ambassador Chen used the, the phrase or the term spectacle and wonderment. Um, but basically the same question to you, either about that spectacle or about the result itself. Uh, what are some of the more interesting things you've heard um, uh, and reflections on, on both the election uh, as a process and the election in terms of its outcome? So thank you very much uh, um, for, for inviting me to this session. And it's great to be uh, on this with Heng Chi and, and, and with Wendy, uh, old friends. Um, I would say at the popular level or in the media, uh, what Heng Chi said about most of Asia is true of Middle East and, and South Asia as well, particularly uh, outside of India in the sense that uh, uh, President Trump has brought a lot of disorder, a lot of uh, angst. Uh, his policies, particularly the Muslim ban in the U.S., has been clearly uh, directed at the Muslim world. Uh, the decisions regarding um, moving the embassy, American embassy, uh, from Jerusalem, from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, these are sort of signature events. And, and generally, there has been a great deal of desire for uh, a Biden victory. In fact, uh, I would say. Iran, for instance, ranked among the countries that was watching the elections most uh, on, on a daily basis. Daily newspapers in Iran were carrying uh, live sessions with, uh, with, with the analysts in the U.S. Uh, uh, on par with what we would see on CNN or, or New York Times going forward. So this is probably the most watched election. Uh, in the region, I would say. Uh, uh, and then there are countries that were very unhappy with, with Biden's uh, victory. I would say Saudi Arabia, in some, some segments of Israel, UAE, Bahrain. These are not countries that were welcoming uh, Trump coming. But, but at the popular level, I would say there's tremendous amount of enthusiasm. At the government level, once you get into official policymaking, I think it's much more divided. And there are those who genuinely welcome uh, a Biden administration because they think it will reduce chances of conflict. It's much more orderly. It's going to put things at least on a predictable track that there be a United States that you can engage in. There's a lot of countries who don't want to get squeezed between China and the U.S. the way that, the, that, that, that Trump has been going about it. Secondly, I, I, I think there are countries that uh, uh, genuinely were benefiting from Trump, like Saudi Arabia, whose ruler got a lot of passes on varieties of issues uh, uh, from, uh, from Trump. And then there are countries who are sitting in the middle. In other words, they, they, they really don't know. Like if you looked at a country like Pakistan or India, they want to see more from the Biden administration before they, they gauge which direction they would move in. But I would raise one issue and going to the hard data notion that Heng Chi raised. I think the, the, the elections gives people a lot of pause because the perception, particularly among uh, thinkers, is that uh, we're going to have back-to-back uh, uh, -back one term presidents. President Biden's age suggests to people that it's probably likely we're going to have another open election in four years. Uh, so the question is, how much can he get done in, in four years? What kind of an attitude can he come out of the gate with? Uh, a lot of countries may be hedging a lot more, uh, thinking, that, you know, how much may they embrace? If you're North Korea or if you're Iran, you may think that, look, we want, can get into another deal with the U.S. And in four years, you're going to have another Republican administration that's going to undo it. So, so the enthusiasm is tempered. And then they would look at the, 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 the fact that, uh, uh, you know, this was not a thumping victory that the Democrats were hoping for. I mean, they still may get the Senate, but they, they didn't sweep the Senate. They lost seats in the House. And, and it was quite a nail biter for three, four days. Uh, and, and Trump did, uh, you know, better than people expected in popular vote. And so there is a sense that the Republic, that Trump made a mess of things, but, but, the, but the movement that he brought forward may, may be back. That gives people pause. And finally, I would say people are really watching hard what's going to happen between now and January 20th. I and mean, Trump is giving every indication that this is going to be as messy as, as it can get. And then what kind of a behavior is he going to 
pursue after he leaves uh, office? And what is the United States in for? Uh, I will just give you an example. Yesterday, <clears throat> there was a report in one of the American newspapers uh, citing sources in the State Department that, that, the, that the United States intends to, to put forward a sort of a flurry of uh, new sanctions against Iran before January 20th. And there are rumors that there might be enactment of further sanctions against China today at the State Department. So, so you know, everybody sort of is tightening their belts about how much damage uh, m might happen. Uh, and I'll stop there. Um, yeah, you, you leave us on a nice positive note. <laughs> Thank you. No, but I mean, it is worth, you know, I don't know how unusual it is, but it is quite unusual uh, to have this period, uh, we call it here lame duck uh, uh, period for, the, for an outgoing president. And it, there was a feeling here in the United States, right, that things were kind of over this weekend. And of course, uh, even in a normal situation, they're not. And, and given uh, everything you've just outlined, uh, it's worth reminding that we are, uh, you know, two plus months away from Inauguration Day. But Wendy let Cutler. Me, let me just add yeah. one thing, if I may, uh, to, to, to what you said, which is, uh, you know, if we're going to be in a, in a, in a time period where, where there's going to be a lot of conflict between now and January 20th, the focus of the United States is going to be very in, internal. That, that gives room to a lot of the bureaucracy that President Trump has put in place on China, on Iran, on other countries to, to do things when nobody's paying attention. That might make diff things difficult. It's not always the president. It's people below him. It's the Peter Navarro's of the world. It's the... It's the Pompeo's of the world who, who have a month to do things when everybody's focused on Arizona or what happens. And this other issue, there's a, worry, a lot of worry that what can, how many coups or events around the world might happen during this period when the United States and Europe and China's attention is on Washington and people may not pay a great deal of attention if countries do certain things or try to do cleanups while we're going. So, so, so the situation is that, you know, we may arrive on January 20th with a situation in some parts of the world that might be different than, than, than uh, where we are on uh, November 9th. Yeah, fasten our seatbelts. Uh, Wendy Cutler. Um, Hope for the best, but fasten our seatbelts. <laughs> yeah, uh, same original question for you, Wendy. I mean, I, no doubt uh, you've been hearing from any number of Asian capitals uh, over the last little period. Um, and I gather that there are real concerns about, about the divisions here. Uh, but but let, let me just stop and just ask you, I mean, what, what are the fundamental uh, top line concerns and questions you're getting from, uh, from folks in Asia? Well, <clears throat> thanks. And it's really my pleasure to join this panel. And it's quite timely. Um, we, I think we picked a good time to do this, given um, the results on Saturday. Before I answer your question, I just want to have a moment of like, let's be a little upbeat and positive, okay? So a lot of the messages I was getting this weekend were like the subject lines were congratulations, welcome back to the world stage, you know, we're really excited. So I just want to kind of put that on the table before we kind of, you know, put, put down a lot of markers on what might happen between now and January 20th. And then after that, um, I heard from some current and formal officials, things like, um, you know, the, the return of multilateralism, the return to the U.S., to international organizations, values, democracy. Um, and these are all, you know, quick, short emails. Um, I got an email from a friend in Korea. Here in Korea, my friends rejoice um, and we welcome America back um, and we expect new days. Um, I heard from Japan where we hope the temperature is lowered and the U.S. returns back to predictability and decency. So, I mean, you know, I, I, I'd say just a real kind of um, welcoming and just glad that there's going to be a change in administration. Now, that said, um, a lot of what Vali and Hang Chi, Hang Chi were saying, I couldn't agree with more because with every welcoming email, there was another one, like what the hell is going on in your country? Someone from New Zealand said with 70, with 70 million voters going for Trump and 48 million Americans saying the president is handling COVID well, your, president is, your new president is gonna have his work cut out for him. So I think there's a real appreciation 
of the divisions in this country and how not only that's going to play out and complicate the ability of, of um, President-elect Biden to govern, um, but also when do people start running for 2024 as well? Um, I, I would just conclude on the remark that I find it fascinating that so many, um, so much of what I'm hearing, all of some pe people around the world are becoming experts on our electoral system. So yeah. people, you know, were emailing on Friday, you know, if if Biden wins Arizona, but he doesn't get Pennsylvania and Georgia's open, <laughs> what does that mean? But really getting into the weeds of this and wanting to know when Trump talks about the Supreme Court, how does that happen? And when does the House of Representatives get involved? So um, I think there's a growing appreciation of our democracy. You know, some people can say it was really messy over you know, the past five days. And my view is, I think this shows democracy works. We clearly, more needs to happen over the next, over the coming days and, and before January 20th. But um, you know, our system is working. The really interesting points, and in particular those emails, Wendy. I mean, between those emails and and the statistics Hank Chi provided, we could uh, yeah. uh, you know there's a there's a paper to be done in there. But let me just follow up, Wendy, on one thing because you did mention, and I hadn't known it uh, uh, until you you shared with me before the program, that in one way or another you have participated in four such uh, transition periods uh, in Washington. And maybe you can just let us in a little bit on, even under normal circumstances, what that period is like from the standpoint of, um, you know, not so much crisis management as they must do. Uh, I think there's a coronavirus task force being named uh, as early as today for the Biden team. But, but what goes on uh, or what has to go on uh, from the standpoint of thinking about issues, let's say, uh, from a foreign policy standpoint in this period, of an interregnum. Yeah, I mean, the transition periods are very important, right? You mentioned before, it's about two months. I think it's people counting 72 days. And it's, it's a lot can happen or cannot happen over that period. Um, now, clearly, um, campaigns have their own transition teams. They're getting ready internally. But what they need to do over those days is to start interfacing with, with current people in the government, in the different government agencies, to find out what's on their mind, to learn more about like the personnel issues, um, and to find out what, what decisions need to be taken, for example, in the first 100 days of an administration. Now, of course, the campaign is doing that. But sometimes when you go into the agencies and you really talk to people working there, you learn a lot more and you learn a lot about the nuances of a lot of these decisions. Um, I have, as you mentioned, I have, at my, during my stay at USTR, I went through four transitions and frankly, they were all very smooth. An office was set aside for the transition team. Um, they were given full access to meeting with people in, you know, in the agency. Um, this time around, we'll have to see how it goes. And I would note that already, the General Services Administration, kind of the agency that's kind of tasked with providing the resources, the offices, and getting things going, they have not called the election. Um, and so, you know, this process hasn't started. Um, again, the campaign is doing the process and they have a transition team, but I'm talking about like the interface with the current government. And frankly, the way President Trump is, this may not happen. We may not see this. And I've even read some people are worried that a lot of the, um, you know, files and a lot of the, the the paper and the emails they won't even be available for, um, you know, for um, the successor administration. So, um, thank you, Wendy. And I want to come back to something that uh, I think you were quoting from from one of those emails: "Welcome America back," right? And this goes to the question, and it's a general impression, and, and maybe I'll start with you, uh, Heng Chi, on this, because uh, you are uh, in, in a region where they may well be welcoming America back. But that presumes uh, that we agree, or that you agree with a premise that has been thrown around a lot, uh, that uh, American credibility has, has been greatly damaged, its reputation uh, damaged. And, and of course, this is a different question with a different answer depending where you, you go in Asia. 
But uh, again, starting with you, Heng Chi, do you believe uh, that the United States has lost credibility in Asia in the last four years? Uh, where in particular, and can it be repaired? Um, I think I would not be telling the truth if I said uh, you did not lose influence and standing, and your, the American t uh, reputation has been affected, tarnished somewhat. But I don't think it really... Uh, it started only with Trump, but it really, you know, uh, moved really, you know, uh, downside with Trump tremendously. I think with the uh, financial crisis, we saw the beginning of it, you know. But during the Trump administration, you know, I think most of the world did not understand what was going on, the unpredictability, the volatility. So that really damaged uh, the United States. And what did the United States stand for? Uh, I think the credibility of the United States has been deeply damaged by the chops and changes that you do to trade agreements, to, you know, when you negotiate with partner, you join something, you know, climate of course, you pull out, you are in WTO, then you don't want to support WTO. I think uh, this is not the America the world looked to for leadership you know, America led after the war. And I, all these institutions, multilateral institutions were built and many followed. I think that we've seen that take, take a big hit. So yes, American credibility has been affected. Uh, and then some of the things that the president says, you know, so uh, I think Americans see that and the world sees that. Uh, how can it be repaired and what needs to be done? I think I want, want to say this very, um, in a very considered way. For Asians, all of us in the Asia Pacific, America has changed. It's a different country. I think we're beginning to grasp this. 70 million votes going to President Trump and 72, is it? 75 and 71 now it keeps changing you know, i think the latest one, yeah it's 75 71 71 million votes goes to the america that president trump stands for now we are discovering what that america means then we are looking at what the america president biden uh, is going to represent so asia must come to understand america i would also say when President Biden goes to the Asia Pacific now, he will find the Asia Pacific slightly different. You know, to say China is a rising power is one thing that we have been talking about. But more than that, I think during this period, in the absence of the United States, when the United States has not taken up leadership in the last four years, and over the pandemic, many small countries and middle-sized countries feel they have a sense of agency. And they have action, they can take action, they can form coalitions, they can do things. For instance, during the pandemic, you know, US uh, leadership was absent. And so Singapore worked with a few countries about, I think, six countries, Australia, New Zealand, Chile, Myanmar, and Brunei, Canada, to uh, agree that we would keep trade open and supply chains open. Other countries then thought it was a good idea and also followed. Canada took leadership and brought together 12 countries. Canada, Italy, Morocco, Mexico, Peru, ROK, Singapore, Turkey, and the United Kingdom. And we pledged to pool our research and scientific resources together and share findings. We wanted to be pro-science, not anti-science. And China is not there, America is not there, US is not there. So what I'm saying is that now you find in the world and in my region, countries believing they can take agency and they can shape their future and form coalitions. So when the United States comes to the Asia Pacific now, after four years being away and the Democrats too, I would say you have to lead but listen and you have to consult much more. And I think this is the new world. And for us, it's getting to know the new America. 
So Vali Nasser, I, you know, I mentioned uh, just as part of the introduction, uh, your book, Dispensable Nation, which was written, what, about six, seven years ago. Uh, I guess it's, it's an apt, uh, uh, it comes to mind anyway, as we ask this question about repairing uh, America's credibility and reputation and perhaps whether uh, America can become indispensable again. Uh, but how would you answer the question of, of the repair job that lies ahead for the United States, wherever you feel in Asia it's most needed? First of all, I think, uh, um, you know, I agree with everything Heng Chi said, and, and, and I would start saying by, that, by, by, the, by saying that we have, to be, we have to have expectations that are now realistic. This idea of a snapback to the, where the United States was is not, is not really realistic for a number of reasons. One is that, um, you know, trust, is, trust takes a long time. Credibility takes a long time to build. It's very easy, easy to shatter. So uh, it's not the president. It's what, as Heng Chi said, it's the American people. If President Trump, even after four years, can get 71 million votes. And also, let's not forget, there's a segment of uh, the Democratic Party, which is also fairly non-interventionist, is, is hostile to trade, was hostile to TPP uh, at its heyday. That it's very difficult to tell countries, particularly have, uh, who have invested their security or national security, whether it's in Europe or in Asia, on, on a perception of United States that belongs to the 19, the post Cold War, to the Cold War era, to now say you continue to think of the United States as the bulwark that it was. And that bulwark is in there. The, the support for the, the kind of America we have in mind is, is not there. Uh, and yes, in the short run, I think President Biden will settle things down, lower the temperature, improve things, at least, at least get us away from Im imminent crises that are, that are unpredictable. But the idea that you would say Japan, Korea, you know, Singapore, many, many other countries are going to just sort of think that you can rely on the U.S. that's not going to veer away again in four years is, is going to be is a tall order. Secondly, I think... You know, realistically, once the enthusiasm settles, that at least we're not we're having somebody in the White House that's not going to do any further damage. You know, America is a very divided place. It is wounded in many ways. And then let's not forget what COVID has done to the American economy. I mean, we haven't seen the worst of it. We haven't seen we're still going through a winter with COVID. You know, uh, the, the, we, we, the rates of unemployment in the U.S., the the, the the economic battering is still on fold. So there's going to be a certain degree of inward looking in the United States, which uh, has impact out. So, you know, the United States cannot afford wars anymore. It will, it, it will get out of uh, Afghanistan. It will, it, will, it will not really want to go to war with Iran. And, and a lot of these countries, uh, which have been sources of regional <clears throat> tensions, are going to calculate that as well. And if, if you're sitting in Northeast Asia, you may think that, you know, U.S. commitment to really reigning in uh, and away or North Korea may not be there. What, what are they going to do on their own? How much they're going to rely on Beijing to manage the situation? Is the calculation has changed? And finally, I would say that, and, and this is an important point that uh, Heng Chi raised about, uh, you know, how uh, uh, the COVID has made the world grow up, if you would, in, in a lot of emerging countries, the sense, sense of agency they have, they've done better than the U.S. Uh, but, but also other things have changed in the world. There are a lot of countries that now sort of think that the U.S. has not really shown a good model either for democracy or governance in the past two, three years. And I don't know, China for the China model used to be standing up, used to be a model for a different reason 10 years ago. But, but again, people are looking at this sort of a combination of technocracy and authoritarianism as better managing the, the, the world we're in. And, and finally, I would say we're, we're not really entering a period of, of, of great power politics. The unipolar moment is over. And it's not just U.S. and China. It's also Russia. It's, it's, it's Europe. Europe is unfettered from the United States. It's not as great a power as the U.S., but it's a senior junior power. The still conversation continues in Europe about what's Europe's future military commitment, its, its own independent future with China and Asia. And so even multilateralism, the idea of cobbling back the world together is not 
is not what it was. So, so I think the, it, what we really need is of the Biden administration. And I do have trust that there are, the brain power is in, in Biden's team for that. And that makes me very hopeful. Has to think of not a return, but as uh, former Deputy Secretary of State Bill Burns put it in an article, of a reinvention that actually is credible to, to all of the countries that Heng Chi mentioned. Because if you just said we're going to go back, it's neither credible to our enemies or adversaries, nor is it credible to our friends. So we have to come up with something that builds on the best of the past, but they would take it seriously. I mean, rather than providing unquestionable security that nobody believes in, we should talk a lot more about partnership in which U.S. would make commitments, but so would countries in the region in a different way that it would be more credible as a viable solution going forward. So I would second that. And I would say, <clears throat> I, I get a sense that U.S. leadership is still wanted, but it's not the unilateralism and not the dominance. And you have to consult other countries and listen to what they have to say. We're taking a short break to tell you about the Asia Society Triennial, which is now open in New York City. More than 40 artists and collectives from 19 countries have been selected to participate in the first citywide festival celebrating contemporary art from Asia. Working across a variety of disciplines and representing countries from across Asia and the Asian diaspora, this dynamic group of artists bring together a diverse range of works and viewpoints. The featured exhibition titled We Do Not Dream Alone is on view at Asia Society Museum and multiple locations throughout New York City. Check out the full list of artists and venue partners coming together at asiasociety.org slash triennial. And now let's get back to the conversation. So can we dive just a bit more deeply into the place where almost any uh, discussion and conversation we ever have here uh, takes us first, which is China. And on the one hand, there is, uh, from what I pick up and read, uh, at least in the, in, in the press and the media around the world as well, not that much likely to change. But on the other hand, I mean, the, uh, uh, the approaches here, and, and I should say that comes largely because of the point Bali just made that, uh, you know, that there is, uh, uh, it isn't just uh, the Republican Party, there is now a bipartisan consensus to, to be tough on China, you know, whatever that means. Um, but I have to also imagine that uh, Joe Biden uh, sees not so much a transactional uh, approach here, but he, he understands and values, uh, you know, uh, at least the potential for a positive and constructive relationship with China. And certainly, as you've all said, in one way or another, the approach is going to be different. So um, I invite any of you to take up um, uh, either what a Biden-China strategy might look like, uh, or maybe with you, Heng Chi, what the region might be hoping for or looking for uh, in terms of a, of a change from what we've seen in the last four years vis-a-vis -vis China. I think most countries in the region want the United States to dial down the rhetoric. You know, uh, I read, you know, that a Japanese scholar in, I read it in SEMP, I think, said that, uh, you know, we wanted the United States to come in, you know, and uh, deal with China, to push back China. But my goodness, they've overdone it. You know, there was a bit of that sentiment, you know. So we want, I think the region, the Asia Pacific, really wants a stable US-China relationship. Everybody here is about business and doing well, but keeping China to the rules. So balance, they're looking for balance. They're not looking for war. They're not looking for conflict. But we know the United States, because of who you are and what you represent, and where the country is now, there's a bipartisan consensus on being tough with China. But you will cooperate. And I think Biden will stand for that. Cooperate where you can and confront where you must, but do not force the region to choose and do not present us with binary choices. I don't think anyone in the region is prepared to take it. And the Indo-Pacific uh, strategy, um, 
ASEAN didn't sign on to that. We came up with the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific, slightly different version of the Indo-Pacific, which is more inclusive and open. So I think Australia is a little bit more open also, not is inclusive, not exclusive. So there are variations and the region has to live with the United States and with China. That's a reality. So no, I think what we would like is a reliable partner, a predictable partner, a pre reliable presence of the US and a predictable presence, but try to do, create a stable relationship with China. I'm, I'm reminded okay. of another issue that we haven't taken up here in, in place of that front, just a viewer noting that climate change may actually provide yes. Uh, uh, at least an area where, where common ground and common cause may be found. And global health security, you know, right. try to work together. And vaccine, you know, why must it be, why must there be competition? This is a global health matter, life and death, you know. I mean, so it seems to me there are areas that the United States could lead in this humanitarian view. No competition is about you know, everyone in the world, everyone's lives. Yep. Wendy Cutler, trade has so dominated uh, the four years of the Trump relationship with China. Uh, what, what do you see in, in that? Uh, we get to uh, TPP or some version of it in a moment, but the U.S.-China uh, trade war, trade deals, redone deals, et cetera. Where, where, where might we see uh, things going on that front? For Biden to succeed and to really show that a multilateral approach can work, our Asian partners are going to need to kind of step up to the plate as well. Now, I'm not saying they need to, you know, to, to endorse everything we want, but um, through a partnership, if the idea is we can be more effective with China if we're united, then um, again, I think we need Asian countries to step up to the plate. And let's just be honest, on the in the trade area, a lot of them in particular have kind of been behind us, okay? I'm not saying we followed the best policy, but a lot of them share our concerns. They were very turned off with our tariff approach. So now is the time, in my view, let's show a multilateral approach works. When I, you know, back to an earlier question, we're talking a little about, you know, can we regain our stature, our trust, our position our, our, um, in the region. And a lot of that, I think, initially can be done with just a change in tone. But I think that will also need to be followed by actions. Now, there's already been some actions um, noted by um, the vice president, the president-elect now, such as rejoining the World Health Organization, um, rejoining the Paris Accord, um, but I'd also like to put on the plate, I think in the trade world, a really good sign would be for the United States to endorse um, the consensus for the new director general of the WTO, um, Dr. Ngozi from um, Nigeria. We're the only country um, blocking that appointment. It's such an important organization, the WTO now, if indeed it's going to play a role in trying to deal with some of these China trade issues. And I just think that would be a really positive sign for the United States to say, yes, we're going to join the others. Let's put her in the helm and let's get to work. Yeah. Bali Nasser, maybe one more beat on China, if we can. Uh, Wendy mentioned the change of tone uh, would be welcome. Um, uh, there are definitely those who would say, well, actually, the Trump tone, or at least the, the tone plus the sort of wild unpredictability actually had some utility in scrambling uh, things a little bit. But uh, comment on that, if you would, or anything else you'd like to say in follow-up to the China conversation we've just been having. Well, my own personal view is that unpredictability is not a strategy uh, because you not only may confuse uh, your adversary, you may confuse yourself as well. And I mean, there's a lot of people here in the U.S. also don't know where we're heading. And if you're a business, major business in America, uh, it, it actually doesn't help you not to have predictability in this relationship. And if uh, the president was trying to sort of create some kind of an economic balance between uh, U.S. and China, uh, you know, the unpredictability is not is not actually helpful, and it would hurt hurt both sides. And then, you know, you lose control of all, all the other countries in the middle because you cannot you cannot have a multi-dimensional chess here. Uh, 
uh, and, um, and, and, and also I want to just say that, you know, we're also entering a period where China is a, I don't want to call it a problem, but it's a, it's a more, it's a more di different kind of a challenge or, or concept for the U.S. We've often, often thought about China as a Pacific issue, as an Asia issue, but China is now showing up increasingly to the West. You know, the, the, one of the big news of the past few months was the talk of a major uh, strategic partnership between China and Iran. Uh, China and Turkey are talking about a, a strategic partnership. Now, we may say these are, these are just not, not that big a deal. It's some money for Belt and Road that China puts in. But, but in the psychology of those countries, it matters. It just tells you that Turkey and Iran are both sort of turning eastward. They're, 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 based, they're, they're getting more of it into a no man's, no man's land. It does give China certain leverage, not, not that the Chinese are going to be sending aircraft carriers to, 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 to the Persian Gulf, but you know, the Chinese are selling nuclear facilities to Saudi Arabia. They're signing strategic partnerships uh, with, uh, with uh, Iran. They're having border skirmishes with India. They're showing up in areas that, that are not traditionally places we've thought about, uh, about China or what it means. And so it does require us to think a little bit more you know, differently about, about uh, uh, you, you know, what, 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 how we're going to manage this, this uh, 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 global, global power. But, but I do think that, you know, uh, uh, driving uh, uh, at, at a rapid pace on a narrow road in a, in a massive truck, uh, you know, thinking of China policy is not really, is not really uh, well thought out. And it's not just about China. I think with a host of issues, it's not clear where President Trump was taking the United States. I mean, the end game wasn't clear. Where is this going to stop? And how are you going to actually prevent the other side from at some point acting in a way that you had not predicted. I mean, when is that going to happen? I mean, just to say that they will not dare to react is a huge gamble that defies any reading of history in the past. So I have to, I have to just jump in and follow up then because Vali, you know a lot of the, uh, the advisors on foreign policy, and they will be deeply engaged and involved. The priority have, have, I'm sure, put together big fat briefing books for the vice president on China. And Vice President Biden, when he was vice president, was was uh, quite involved uh, in the China portfolio. So, so what do you think, given everything you've just said about the last four years, what do you think might be the beginnings of a Biden strategy uh, on China, given that, as you say, you can't just have a big truck like you just described. What, what, what might we be seeing that will be different? Well, I mean, and also Heng Chi and, and Wendy uh, have, have been very involved here. I would say, you know, the, the, the most hopeful thing I have about this administration is that President Biden will be a great communicator and he also will set the tone with the Congress in a right way. And he has great relationships there. I mean, you know, even with Lindsey Graham and the like. So, so as a president, his job would be to communicate to the American people, American foreign policy and why it should be in a particular way. And then we should be able to work with Congress, Senate and House of Representatives to get things done on trade, et cetera. And I do think he has tremendous amount of capabilities there. He's probably very well endowed there. And then, you know, the actual policy is not necessarily in his mind, even though he has tremendous amount of experience, but it's the team that he will bring. And, you know, that was also something that was missing in the, in the Trump administration. You had too many political hacks, too many people with no experience in foreign policy, and then no foreign policy process. You know, you could call the president's son-in-law, or, or he would be watching somebody on, on Fox News, and that became policy or a policy statement or a tweet. So having people that, that people in Asia know, they have worked with in the past, they have relationships with, that people who are professional, that, that, that think about data and policy and proceed in a methodic way, I think that's going to be Biden's greatest comp contribution out of the gate. I mean, the return of professionals to Washington. I think that's, that's the tremendous sort of exciting news. Now, what they can accomplish, we can debate uh, uh, on. But, but first things first, you can run foreign policy with political hacks, you know, who, who, who just want to please one man and, and, and have no experience in, in doing this. So, so I, I think we will see a lot more professionalism in, in, in approach to Asia. 
So as the, uh, the professionals come back, uh, we have a, a question that will sound very simple, and it, I think goes to you, Wendy, but it's, the answer probably isn't simple at all. Will the United States rejoin uh, the TPP under a Biden administration? Now, again, just to refresh memories, I mean, again, this is a, a, a partnership and a trade agreement that Wendy Cutler was deeply involved in, as we said at the outset. Uh, I believe it was one of the first uh, of, of several deals that President Trump said, I think he said about all of them, they're the worst deals ever negotiated, right? Um, and, uh, and so I guess there's two questions. Will the Biden administration be um, uh, keen to do that? And, and, and are the countries that are signatories to the TPP really excited about having the United States back in? How does that work? I'll stop there. Well, this is a great opportunity for me to plug my latest Asia Society paper on this issue. Um, so I would just refer you to our website, probably more you ever want to know about this question. But just a few takeaways I would share. Um, and that is, I think it's, it's very interesting as, um, as you know, Biden's talked about um, rejoining the Paris, the Paris Agreement looking at the Iran agreement, he's been pretty quiet on TPP. And I think that's for you know, a number of reasons, including that his party is very divided on trade. Um, and he's made it clear that he's gonna be focusing on domestic issues, um, re, you know, rebuilding America, making rebuilding America's competitiveness, dealing with COVID, rebuilding infrastructure, so we can negotiate trade agreements from a position of strength. Um, so I don't rule it out, but part of me thinks maybe the days of doing these really big trade agreements may be either behind us or they're not going to be they're not going to be happening right away. And so one of the important takeaways from from the paper I wrote is that even if we haven't made a decision on TPP, which I still believe makes sense for the United States then we should look at narrower deals on like a, you know, specific issues um, to pursue in Asia, whether it be on digital trade, whether it be on climate and trade, whether it be on medical supply chains, but do something narrower. And, and why I think this makes sense, A, it would have an impact and there are plenty of issues that coming out of COVID where we could really benefit from having rules develop with other countries. Um, and, and um, it's, it's, it's doable. It's a way to rebuild trust with our partners. And again, coming back to something I said earlier, I think a change in tone is important, but at a certain point, our partner's gonna be looking to us for actions and for concrete signs of, of changes in, in our policy and our tone. Thank you, Chan. Did you have something you wanted to add to that? Thank you, Wendy. Yeah, well, actually, I wanted to add to Vali, but, you know, I, I can also say something about what uh, Wendy said. Um, I agree with Vali and his point about, you know, the return of professionals. Now, I don't want to make too much of professionals, you know, but, you know, we are all professionals. But I think during the last four years, the problem was that there weren't enough people appointed in the administration whether it was the State Department, Treasury, Defense, you just name it. And uh, ambassadors in Washington, Wendy would know this, often said, who is that you talk to? Who do you talk to? Not enough people around. And as a result, you don't get as many visitors to Washington because there's nobody to see them. And there are not many visits to the region. And I would say this, that actually in Asia, 90% of your success has been there face-to-face -face meetings and being present at summits is extremely important. Mm -hmm. And I think that has to be emphasized. So this professionals being there in place is very important. And I know during the Obama first administration, there was a very active uh, state team, you know, just Hillary and Kurt and his team. And they made so many visits to the region. They made Southeast Asia matter. And Southeast Asia felt, wow, suddenly people are interested in us. We're not just a stop after Northeast Asia, you know? So it made a world of difference, but that has slipped, you see. Yeah. But I think I would, you know, we wish Biden well and hope that uh, 
he will come through and will be able to manage everything. But I think people in the region, certainly at the leadership level, realize what a difficult job he has, that the country is split. Congress will, you know, Senate is in the hands of the Republicans unless there's a sudden flip. And uh, the last time I recall, I was in Washington then, where the Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell said he would make uh, Obama a one-term president. Now, is that his dedication now? You see, and so your internal fights, and it is a problem, you know, because when the United States comes to the region, it should not be just to talk about military agreements, military uh, and security cooperation. The region wants to hear you talk about trade, investment, you know, assistance. And if you have a Congress that is not supportive, it's very hard for your president, for all President Biden's wanting to move, he would be, you know, uh, held back. So I think there's a re realization in the region. We now know America, we've seen this, we've seen the fights in Congress and so on. So um, the leaderships, the political leaderships, the elites, know it is not easy. And, but you somehow wish it could be easier, you know? And so uh, I think that's where it stands. Yes, will we help? I think all the countries, the friends of the United States, uh, would want to help if they can. It's within their, you know, ability. But uh, if you keep demanding payment for like basis, and so it just just doesn't go down. Well, Korea, uh, Japan, South Korea, and Japan. So uh, we'll see when the issue comes up. You see, the I've always said, you know, no. How do, does the region choose? You know, how do we choose? We don't sit there and say, we are now turning pro-China or we're turning pro-US. It doesn't happen like that. There are initiatives put on the table, initiatives put by the United States, initiatives put down by China. People signed up for TPP, then you took it away. You know, you put uh, F, uh, the free and open Indo-Pacific, there, not many people signed up. China put down BRI, people signed up. AIIB, they signed up. Reset, sign up. You see, so it's how many initiatives you can bring to the table. And that's how choice is made. So the United States and the Biden administration has to think up what sorts of agreements. So Wendy, to your point that you cannot do big agreements, can you do small agreements? Can you do, you know, um, the smaller trade guarantees, investment guarantees, do something, but there should be initiatives on the table. And can there be education initiatives? So people can sign on to it. And I think uh, President Obama came with a big youth initiative uh, in his administration to Southeast Asia. So it's actions, initiatives such as this that add up. Thank you, Heng Chi. Um... Uh, I'm reminded um, as you speak, but also by a viewer who is reminding me that we've gone nearly an hour and I don't believe North Korea has come into the conversation. Uh, so there's a question about that. And famously four years ago in the transition period, uh, President Trump actually talked a lot about this, that in his one-on-one uh, -on -one with, uh, with then President Obama, uh, that was uh, what Barack Obama told him he would have to worry about most as he came to power. Now, Bali Nasser, maybe I'll put you on the spot on this one, although anybody, please feel free to jump in. Uh, there was a lot of um, criticism of President Trump's approach to, uh, you know, the, the, the summits that he had with Kim Jong-un, uh, the quote-unquote romance or love letters or whatever you want to say about uh, their unusual relationship. Um, and, and it has, it's, it's quite clear it has not produced what, what President Trump suggested after one of those meetings it would produce. But it's also fair to say that, uh, and not that this is an easy thing to tackle, but uh, the record of predecessors wasn't great either. Uh, is there anything in terms of a policy or strategy that you think we may be um, uh, seeing that, that uh, holds out any hope on that front? 
I would just say, generally speaking, uh, that uh, you know, trying diplomacy is not a bad idea. Trying new things is not a bad idea. But but you have to have a strategy for success. He didn't, and you he didn't even have a team that believed in what he was doing. I mean, one of the things all of us have learned: if 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 you want to get something done, uh, you have to actually have your secretary of state or national security advisor or your negotiators actually believe in, in, in what you're doing. And, and, and Trump didn't have that. Uh, and that's also, is not, again, is not credible to, to the other side. People are not always looking at the president. They're looking at who, who's going to do the follow-up after the president is, is, leaves the room. And Trump didn't think through about this. I, I often thought that actually you know, a failed summit was exactly what he needed because it placated the non-interventionist side of his party where he would say, I'm really trying this and I'm doing this. And then at the same time to the neoconservative side of his party was saying, well, nothing's going to happen anyways. And, and, and actually, we're going to put even more sanctions on, South, on, on North Korea. So, so increase sanctions at the same time, meet with them. It was more of a domestic strategy for him than actually really a diplomatic strategy. So I would say the Biden administration has to come in and pick it up from where it is. So certain taboos has been broken. Heads of states have already met. So, you know, there's no point in trying to deny that that's happened. But what's a credible strategy for the region in terms of managing North Korea? If you're going to engage him, how are you going to do it in a way that is going to be uh, uh, productive? And the same logic applies to Iran. The same logic applies to China. The same logic applies to to Russia. And that's exactly why I think unpredictability is not a strategy. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, yeah. it just nobody really believes in, in what he was doing. Well, one more for you, Vali, and then I'm, we're, we'll come to closing remarks, if you will. But uh, we have a question. Uh, could Professor Nasser comment on the future of U.S. relations with India uh, with a focus on the Quad? I'm reminded again, it's, it's a big continent and we've, we've managed to go this far with very little mention of India. Uh, changes coming there, or are we on a on a kind of status quo track? Do you think? Well, I, I think Heng Chi and, and and Wendy should talk more about that particularly because I think a, a large part of India's issues would be trade related. I mean, you know, we don't have a major political outstanding issues. The question is again, you know, the the love fest between the prime ministers, etc., was not matched with some of the ways in which President Trump was trying to handle India on on trade and economic issues. Wendy. I think you should you would be better placed to answer that question. And uh, you know, when it comes to India and trade and investment or economic relations, it's there's a lot of potential there and a lot of administrations have really tried to kind of up the game with India and um it's just been really difficult. The Trump administration has really tried to even do a mini deal with India which seemed to be a mini trade deal which seemed to be on the cusp of announcement, but was never announced um, because I'm not sure India has figured out whether they really want to open up their market or they don't. And as a result, it, you know, it's a very difficult country to deal with on the trade front. Um, next week in Asia, 15 countries are going to be signing the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Negotiation It used to be 16 countries. They negotiated with India for seven of the past eight years. And India um, withdrew from that agreement. They will not sign it. And it's a huge disappointment to the other um, partners. And so this isn't just a US problem with India on the economic front. Um, I think it's much broader than that. And I think India on its own has to figure out how and how and whether it wants to integrate, you know, its economy with the rest of the world because it's falling behind. I mean, just two years ago, India's growth rate was among the highest in not only Asia, but the whole world. And when you look at um, their growth rates now, it's just plummeting with, with the COVID problems and the, you know, the resulting economic downturn. But that said, um, it's, it's, you know, it hasn't changed its policies with respect to how it looks um, outwardly um, to other economies. Thank you. you, know, you uh, uh, on that? Just, to, just to add this, I think uh, the United States has been uh, working with India from the time of Bill Clinton. You know, he went to India and tried to develop the relationship with India. Both President Bush did the same, and I think President Obama. Uh, The question I ask is whether, and President Trump has gone there, but it's much more a personal relationship 
between Prime Minister Modi and President Trump. And you remove President Trump, you know, will that be the same relationship? And maybe the United States has to create more institutional relationships with India. Mm -hmm. And uh, I may not be fair here, but and maybe with the trade uh, people, <clears throat> Wendy, there is a, you know, you have relationships and the defense people have relationships, but, you know, if the United States goes to Korea, you have institutional relationships, Japan, institutional relationships, Australia, and so on. And I would say with Singapore too. And uh, it's, um, it's a question of, uh, whether you have enough of these institutions or strong enough institutional relationships or everything depends on the top two personalities. Thank you. So, so we need to move to wrapping and I'm going to put you all on the spot with one last question uh, and it can cover anything we've been talking about or perhaps something we've missed. Uh, so uh, as we've said, the Biden administration will not surprisingly come in with a to-do list or a first hundred days plan or whatever you want to call it that will probably be largely focused on the domestic issues uh, that are, uh, you know, COVID, the economy, racism, et cetera. Um, but if, if each of you were to have, I don't know, a half hour or an hour, be it in the Oval Office or at the State Department, uh, to, to, to just say that, you know, here is something in Asia that you really ought to focus on and try to get done or advance in some fashion in, in the early part of your administration. Mindful Valley, as you said, that it, you know, this may be a, a, a one-term presidency and how quick things can turn here. So putting you each on the spot, maybe Wendy Cutler, we'll start with you. How, how would you use that time if, uh, if you wanted to advance one particular position or another? Well, I'm just gonna put um, one concrete idea on the table and that is perhaps the U.S. should think about hosting APEC in 2023. New Zealand hosts next year, Thailand hosts in 2022. The last time we hosted was 2011. Um, this is the organization involving um, 21 economies from the region. And the reason I'm putting this, and I, I would suggest this, I think it's a great way for the United States to show its engagement and leadership in the region it's doable, um, and frankly, substance then would, um, would fall from that because as we prepared for our leadership in APEC, we would then prepare what, what are called deliverables, substantive, tangible outcomes that would be meaningful to the region. Thank you. Uh, Ali Nasser, you're, you're in the room where it happens. What are you going to say? So I would say that you know you you have uh, uh, Southeast Asia, East Asia, where you have a, a lot of multilateral structures that that exist in the region that the United States can work with, and then you look at West Asia, and it's just completely absent. Uh, it doesn't exist. There's no there's no mul regional multilateral structure. So so the U.S. should really, I think, use the time to try to build that because ultimately, as China moves west, as Asia may may become more whole. Uh, you know, the, the kinds of alliances, the kinds of regional structures that exist in East Asia are a great model for the Middle East and West Asia as well. And, and that's not something that you necessarily can get done in four years, but you could actually begin, uh, begin, the begin building those structures. And, and I think ASEAN would be a great model to, to think about West Asia. It, uh, and, and that helps the United States as well, because it might help reduce the regional tensions, and, and, and I don't think there's any other way forward unless the United States wants to sit in the region permanently. Uh, and, and, and then, you know, to do that, you have to do a lot of other little things. You have to talk to people, you have to get people to talk to each other, you have to do trade, you have to make investments, and, 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 but that's a great model to, for the U.S. to have as a mantra going forward, as a different kind of an approach to the region. Thank you, Vali. Last word comes to you, Heng Chi. You're, you're, you're uh, back I in would Washington. Say, <laughs> uh, Mr. President, you know, uh, we understand that right now you have your domestic priorities and we understand that and you want to get COVID under control. But foreign policy is one area where you can actually have some freedom to do without Congress hamstringing you, you know, and you may want to take some action there. And if you come to the region, if you just do something very little, show your presence again, it would be just wonderful. The United States now, under the Trump administration, 
the military presence was there. For knots was very constant and was present, and I think everybody noticed that. But I think uh, President, uh, the new next president, President Biden, can take action. Trade is not so doable, although APEC is a good idea. But climate change is a subject that speaks to the administration, to President Biden himself, but to the region, because we are all devastated by climate, you know, every of the countries in Southeast Asia. So if you could come with something, you know, and lead a multilateral effort to try to build a climate coalition, some ways of giving assistance. If you return to the accords, the United States would make a contribution mm -hmm. to the fund. So that would be already helpful. And that I think that would be very visible and that would be a good gesture. I'm just trying to think of non-trade, you know, my first reaction would be to be to say trade, but I know how hard it is. So I'm saying climate. Thank you for listening to Asia In Depth. You can listen to other episodes of the Asia In Depth podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, and YouTube. Check out our show page at asiasociety.org slash podcast and follow us on Facebook and Twitter at Asia Society. I'm Michelle Flor Cruz. See you next time.